Welcome everyone to this webinar of the Linguistic Society of America. Today we have the next installment in our Meet the Author series in which we feature authors whose articles have been published in our most recent issue of the journal Language. I'm pleased to welcome our panel, which includes two recently tenured linguists involved with language documentation, Kayla Begay from Cal Poly Humboldt and Jorge Rosas Labrada from the University of Alberta, and the authors of a new paper in language assessing scholarship in documentary linguistics, Andrew Garrett from UC Berkeley and Alice Harris from UMass Amherst. In this 90-minute webinar, our presenters will give a presentation for about an hour, after which they will respond to your questions in a Q&A session. You can submit your questions at any time during the webinar using the control panel on your screen. And so without any further ado, I turn this webinar over to our panelists. Hi, everybody. Um, we thought we would begin, although Mark already said who we were, we thought we would begin with brief introductions. Um, my name is Andrew Garrett. I teach linguistics at the University of California, Berkeley. And I'm Alice Harris. I'm retired from the University of Massachusetts Amherst. I'm Jorge Rosas Labrada. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Linguistics at the University of Alberta. Um, hey, I'm Kayla, Kayla Begay Hulia. Uh, my name is Kayla Begay. Kidnis Duis Achis Chuet Alftet, Cal Poly Humboldt Olia. I am an assistant professor in Cal Poly Humboldt. Or, excuse me, associate now, as of a few months ago. <laughs> Still have to get that going in my, my brain, but very happy. That was an excellent, uh, excellent moment for us. Um, so, the, um, Alice and I uh, recently published a paper, a short paper, a commentary in language called Assessing Scholarship in Documentary Linguistics. Um, and what Alice and I thought we would do in our part of the presentation is just to say a bit about, um, about how this paper came to be, um, who it's for, what it is and isn't, and one or two of what we thought of as the big takeaways. Um, so we wrote the paper because of a problem that I think people who do documentary linguistics confront, and also a problem that their colleagues confront, um, their colleagues in their departments at whatever institutions they're at and outside their departments. The problem comes about because um, this is a newish field, documentary linguistics, and lots of academics who are outside of linguistics are not familiar with the field, and even some linguists are not that familiar with it. Um, it's also it can be seen as unusual, I think, by some academics, because it includes elements that are not um, that are sometimes not seen as prototypical or archetypal for uh, academic research. Um, but those elements can be quite critical for the for the discipline of documentary linguistics. Um, we feel, as many people do, that um, documentary linguistics is a really important part of linguistics and should be supported. Um, by the discipline and in colleges and universities. So this paper came about as one of several efforts by the Linguistic Society of America to support um, this field. And, and Alice, do you wanna say a little more yeah, about I, the history? Yeah, I just wanted to say, to add that um, in 2016, when I was president of the LSA, I was approached because of my position by a, a faculty chair a, a department chair, excuse me, who had um, a young uh, faculty member who was up for tenure and who asked how, who asked me how she could be supported. And I didn't have the answers and I couldn't get the answers in time. Um, and I didn't wanna see this happen anymore ever again. So uh, the the uh, executive committee um, passed a statement um, which we cite in the paper. There's a, um, uh, a, a URL for it given um, that that makes a statement about the importance and some suggestions about how uh, how assistant professors well, how anyone, not just assistant professors, anyone can be assessed. Um, but we thought it, it, it was important to do more. And in fact, 
I held a, an ad hoc meeting at the uh, LSA annual meeting. Uh, um, Jorge was one of the people there and the people who attended the meeting suggested that I write this article. I found that I couldn't write it by myself. I needed Andrew. Um, and so we wrote it together and it has taken a long time, but at least it's out finally. We don't want to see we don't want to see problems happen again. We don't want to see people in a situation where no one knows how to assess their work. And I think that was a good point that you raised about um, kind of the levels at which this happens, because it happens at all levels, like right. with job applications, people who apply for jobs need to be able to present themselves in a compelling way and hiring departments need to sort of recognize what's important in their dossiers. Obviously for tenure, it's really important, but for all kinds of promotion before merit increases before tenure and other promotions after tenure, um, it continues to be important. Um, so that is the history. Um, we should say a little bit about our positionality in relation to um, the discipline and how that kind of affects our perspective in the way that we wrote the paper. Um, Alice and I are non-Indigenous scholars uh, whose training was outside of documentary linguistics when we were trained as um, young linguists uh, in historical linguistics and in syntax. Our documentation work has focused on two different, very different parts of the world, um, having to do with languages of California and the Caucasus. We have worked in research universities, um, not small colleges, um, and in linguistics departments, I guess I should say, in research universities, um, not indigenous studies departments or anthropology departments or English departments. Um, we have had uh, leadership roles in the LSA. Alice was president of the LSA and I was on the LSA executive committee at one point. And we have both served as department chairs, which is a really critical role for anybody who's um, getting hired or getting promoted. And the department chairs serve as the advocates for faculty members in the whole process. Um, our experiences in American universities, US universities, um, and I think that, and, and it's limited to the universities that we have worked at, um, we think that a lot of what we wrote in the paper is going to be relevant for people in other um, contexts in North America, people in small colleges, people in, um, in uh, four-year colleges that don't emphasize research, teaching, teaching universities, people in other departments besides linguistics. But um, the further one gets from a North American research university, the less applicable some of what we wrote about um, might be, especially outside of North America. So um, that can be something we talk about later, I guess. Um, the paper was intended um, for a mixed group of readers. Um, so one target group of readers is documentary linguists who are themselves um, looking to get hired or <clears throat> looking to get tenured or looking to get promoted. Um, so if you're preparing your materials for a job application or for a merit review or for a tenure case, um, we hope that some of what we said will be useful for you. Um, we also are trying to be useful for people who are colleagues of documentary linguists who are not themselves documentary linguists, people who might want, who might be in the same department but wonder what is it that this kind of scholar does. Um, that same department might might not be a linguistics department, so the colleagues might not be linguists even. Um, they might be indigenous studies scholars or anthropologists or English scholars or um, something else. Um, but in all cases, um, they will be the kind of first level of um, peer evaluation, your colleagues in your department. Department chairs often need to know something about what kind of a field this person is involved in. Um, the department chair, again, might not be a linguist or they might be a linguist who's far from documentary linguistics. And some of what happens in documentary linguistics might be new to a department chair. And then in every institution that we know of, there's review outside of the department um, that differs, of course, from place to place, but it will often involve a dean or a provost or an academic personnel committee 
And those people are usually not linguists or people familiar with collaborative work with indigenous communities or really anything that's in the dossier of documentary linguist. We're not so optimistic as to think that every dean will read our paper, um, but it is our, I mean, we tried to keep it short so that an interested dean might conceivably read it um, or an interested member of an academic personnel committee outside of linguistics might read it. And in any case, we think it would be feasible for department chairs to point to specific things in the paper or quote things in the paper um, that would be useful for those, those people outside the department. Um, it, we feel also that it's important to emphasize what this paper isn't. <clears throat> so it's not an overview of documentary linguistics. Um, and uh, that would be a much longer project. Um, and there are many excellent overview articles and books about documentary linguistics, some of which we mentioned. Um, so it's not a good place to go to find out everything about what the field is. And it's also definitely not an attempt to say what parts of documentary linguistics are good and what parts are bad, or um, what we think you should do if you're a documentary linguist. Um, documentary linguists do lots of different kinds of things, and not everybody does everything. Some people primarily in, are involved with language revitalization. Some people are not very involved with language revitalization, but are intensely involved with corpus building. Um, there are lots of different profiles to being a documentary linguist, and our goal was to try to validate everybody um, and not try to say, you know, this is the way to be a documentary linguist and this isn't. So we're trying to cover kind of different kinds of things that people do. Um, so that's kind of um, where the paper was coming from and what it's for, I guess. Um, and Lastly, we wanted to just say a bit about um, kind of a bit about the um, ideas that we presented or the um, view that we presented. And um, this this last slide has two sets of things on it. Um, one is to emphasize, um, and this is maybe the part of assessing the profile of a documentary linguist that maybe most unexpected for somebody outside of the field um, to emphasize that people doing documentary linguistics produce a range of scholarly outputs um, that do not always conform to the kind of classical academic archetype of articles in peer-reviewed journals or publications with university presses. Um, we classified things um, maybe a bit arbitrarily but into five groups that we talked about a bit, um, and I've listed these groups on the slide here. So one group is projects, not even written materials necessarily, but projects about documentation that are community-based. Um, these can be set in, in language nests or language camps or other kinds of community activities like language pods. These will differ from place to place and community to community. They might be training of local um, local people to do recordings. They might be um, audiovisual documentation of cultural practices or of classroom activities um, done in collaboration with uh, local communities. And critically, this kind of activity, the output is actually the activity and the relationships that come out of the activity and the knowledge that emerges from the activity. Um, you can also write an article about this activity, but that's a secondary work. Um, it's important, I think, in presenting your case and in evaluating your case fairly to recognize that it is the project, it is the activity that's the, um, the output in this case. There are also lots of different kinds of community-oriented publications that many documentary linguists, not all, but many produce, sometimes spending lots and lots of time to produce them, um, ranging from picture books for kids, um, pedagogical grammars, lessons, collections of lessons, um, websites that are designed for distance learning, um, picture dictionaries or thematic dictionaries, pedagogical grammars, um, and other things that sort of fill in that space. Um, most of these kinds of things are not peer reviewed in the traditional sense. They're peer reviewed maybe in a more um, demanding sense that they have to 
satisfy the needs of the, the peer needs of the community, but they don't go through what academics traditionally recognize as peer review. Um, and they're just as important for the research in this field. Um, another important thing that many art documentary linguists do is to produce archival collections in collaboration with communities. These will often be archived in a preservation repository. They might come with a finding aid that somebody has written um, or some other kind of descriptive overview, which may be itself part of the collection or might be published separately. Um, these are in some ways the longest lasting scholarly outputs of any documentary linguist. They will outlast your lifetime. Um, they will still be used in a hundred years. Um, I sometimes myself tell students that's the most important thing they'll ever do um, is to create documentary collections that will last forever. Um, and those are important parts of people's scholarship, um, not just appendixes to their scholarship. Um, but again, they're not, they're not archetypal publications. Um, some people publish um, text collections or dictionaries or texts, and those are sometimes published with publishers like university presses, but they're also sometimes published locally. Um, they're hard sometimes to publish with um, academic publishers, um, but those are extremely important for communities and they also involve a lot of work. And lastly, there are the things that are conventionally published by you know, academic publishers, grammars and analytic articles and books. Um, and it really was important for us to try to emphasize that all of these kinds of things are uh, components of the research of documentary linguists. Um, and it's not that you know, the last category listed is the only important thing. They're all potentially equally important. Um, so um, for someone outside of documentary linguistics, it's important to see that these are all parts of the work. For someone in documentary linguistics, it's important, I think, myself think, um, to emphasize all of these aspects of your work and not to undersell yourself by listing some of them just as you know appendixes or footnotes in your dossier. And this led us to um, kind of some thinking about the way that, at least in the American context, one often has to present one's dossier. Um, one often has to sort of divide up one's life into research and teaching and service. And um, at some universities, like we were talking about privately before, at some universities, there are actually percentages that are assigned to each of these components. And you're supposed to do you know, 20% of service and 40% of teaching or whatever. Um, and that way of dividing up your academic life can present challenges for people in documentary linguistics because some of what documentary linguists do is perceived by others as service, um, while some of it is perceived by others as research. Um, that's a really, we think, kind of arbitrary distinction. Um, if your institution insists on that distinction, you know, you can't change that necessarily. But we think it is important to try to push back against it to some extent. And for you as the candidate, as the documentary linguist, and especially for department chairs or colleagues or whoever is advocating for you, we think it's important for in that advocacy process to emphasize that the research, although it may have to be presented piecemeal in these different categories, um, kind of depending on the needs of the institution, the research is actually a coherent whole. So we wrote this indented paragraph. Um, the totality of a documentary linguist's professional work may encompass significantly more than books with academic presses and articles in refereed journals. Distributing that work among multiple categories of assessment may inaccurately present a coherent research whole as a collection of individual parts that are therefore less compelling. For instance, um, suppose you publish some academic articles you know, in journals and you are involved in teaching a language in the community and you um, help with revalorization activities or preparing um, community materials. Maybe those three things you would put somehow, somehow under research and teaching and service, but they're the same, you know, it's the same work that you're doing and anything that partitions your work into categories, separate categories makes it look less coherent, less compelling. So um, 
documentary linguists should ideally um, emphasize this, and especially department chairs and other people who are you know, writing the memos that will get them tenure um, should uh, emphasize the coherence of the research, you know, the research whole. Um, so that's a brief summary of why we wrote this paper and what we hoped to achieve. Alice, do you want to add anything? I don't think I have anything to add. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will pass things over to Jorge. I'm not muted anymore. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, thank you, Andrew. Um, for over the last 10 years or so, um, I've been involved in uh, primary work documenting uh, languages, indigenous languages of the Americas, both in North America and South America. And these projects, which are here on um, the left side of the screen, uh, have all resulted in audiovisual materials that were collected as part of uh, collaborative projects with communities. Um, I have also been working on projects to rescue uh, collections that were recorded in the past. Um, and so some of what I'm going to talk about and really what I want to do is kind of share my recent experience of going through this process, in particular going through tenure and trying to, as Andrew said, uh, sh present the research as a whole and not just as like disparate parts um, is in the context of these materials and these collections. Um, more generally, I'm interested in documentation, revitalization, uh, language description and typology, and historical linguistics and language change. So some of my publications are in these areas. Um, I want to kind of give you a general timeline here so that you kind of have a general idea of the work that we're talking about. Um, so I did my PhD at the University of Western Ontario and at Lyon uh, from 2009 to 2015. And I started in my field work in 2012, officially. Um, then I did a postdoc at the University of British Columbia and I was hired here at the University of Alberta in 2017. Um, and I uh, was an assistant professor until July of this year. Um, so I just went through tenure. Uh, this is kind of what the process looks like a little bit here. Um, so in May of last year, we submitted a dossier to the department chair. Um, that dossier is used by the department chair to get three external assessments. Um, so it gets sent out to three different people uh, for a cell review. Um, I'll say here that this is kind of a black box process for us because at that point you're not really involved anymore <laughs> and you don't know who those people are. Um, and so it's kind of a mystery at that point. Um, what you uh, see is in the letter that the uh, chair writes to support or not support your tenure file, um, you get a brief glimpse of what people said um, that is summarized. Um, and then there is a discussion at the faculty levels in a big committee, um, and then tenure becomes effective the July that follows that discussion in the fall. Um, I'll focus here on what I did prior to submitting the dossier because this is the part that I had direct control over. <laughs> uh, the rest of the process, you don't have a whole lot of control over. Um, I'll say that leading up to that point when you have to submit your dossier, we do have uh, annual performance reviews every year, um, and these dictate uh, your merit incrementation. And by merit, really, that means also your salary incrementation. Um, and what I did over the last five years was list archival deposits as publications. And I tried to explain to my chair uh, who is a psychologist and psycholinguist, and uh, the why of the why I was doing that because for him that was unusual. 
And I was able to also share with him the LSA resolutions and statements on the why and explain that uh, because he's the person who advocates for all of the faculty members in the department at the faculty level um, in these yearly reviews. Um, the tenure dossier itself that gets sent out to the external reviewers includes your CV, your publications, and an optional research statement. And I highlight the optional part here. Uh, in most places, this is required. Here it was optional, but I made sure that to include one. I'll say that in just a moment. Um, the things that I did to ensure that the archival collections were counted as publications uh, was to include them in the publications folder. And this all gets sent out as a link to a Google Drive. So obviously, you can't put the entire collection in there because that would just be too cumbersome. And um, also, there's sensitivities around sharing the data that way. Um, um, and so what I did was I tried to find a way to grant the reviewers access to the collections in the repositories where they are. And then I prepared short descriptions of each collection based on uh, a recent article by uh, Ryan Something. Um, and then I tried to contextualize the contributions of my research uh, through the research statement. And it's really key what Andrew was saying, uh, trying to present your research as a whole, even though um, some of the component parts may be listed in different parts of your CV. Um, I'll, what I want to do in the next uh, couple of slides is just share with you specifically what I did here um, to grant access to reviewers and what the descriptions were. I'll also say a bit about what I wish I had done differently. Um, my hope is that by sharing this, other people will find it helpful, other people who may be going through the same process soon. Um, obviously, there's a caveat here, and it's that it's unclear to me because I was kept in the dark uh, to what extent the reviewers engaged with the materials that I sent uh, beyond the publications themselves. Um, however, uh, as I said, we do see excerpts from what the evaluator said, and I know from those excerpts that at least two people mentioned the LSA resolution uh, on the importance of language documentation. So, uh, I think my reviewers were very aware of uh, the work that I did and uh, the importance of it. Uh, so I think that that is helpful. Um, as I said, like everything gets sent out as a Google Drive folder. Uh, you can include a collection in there for several reasons. Um, the, what I tried to do was just create a very simple kind of readme file. And this is just a screenshot of that explaining how to access the collections. Um, there were five collections that I wanted reviewed. Two are deposited in ELAR, two are ILA, and one is in the California Languages Archive. Um, for ELAR, um, I talked to the archive, and um, the best way to access them was for people to use their own usernames. Um, there were some materials that are subscriber access and therefore uh, need uh, a special password. Um, I said that they could contact our secretary for access to those materials because I couldn't be directly in touch with the reviewers not knowing who they were. Um, they didn't or I never was asked um, so I don't know if they were able to access those materials. Um, with Isla what I did was I set up a fake username and password or temporary username and password for with different account and I gave them that. Um, that password also gave them access to um, the materials that were uh, more sensitive in nature. And, uh, and then I mentioned the five brief guides to their collections, and I'm going to talk about what that looks like. Um, and I also mentioned two corpora that I worked with, which are not archived. And, um, and this is also kind of a caveat here. The, I was able to present this for people to evaluate because these materials are archived and some at, at some level accessible. Um, but I realized that there is many communities that feel some level of discomfort and oftentimes rightly so with depositing things open access or depositing them at all. Um, so if you're in that situation, obviously this may not be uh, terribly helpful uh, to you. Um, the Brief guides, I prepare one for each, um, and they range from 
five pages to 11. Um, I included some general information about each collection uh, following the categories in the Sullivan paper. Uh, crucially, I tried to kind of capture the extent of the scope of the content included, any access and use restrictions. Uh, I had in table form a detailed contents list and um, some additional information about uh, access and a bit of contextualization of the project. Um, and then there were other uh, kinds of information that were more general. Um, and so we when we organize our folder with the publications, we put them in categories like book, book chapters, journal articles. Um, and so I created another uh, folder or subfolder that said corpora and both the readme file and the uh, brief descriptions uh, were inside that uh, folder. Um, I just come here to the end of what I have to say, but and I hope that we can discuss it all of this a little bit more. Uh, and it's that I wish I had separated the curated legacy materials I worked with from the original materials that I collected myself, uh, where the collections overlapped. And so, for example, for Pieroa, uh, these materials from legacy co collections are included in my own ELAR collection. And I'm not sure at to what point that made it less visible. Um, that other work. Um, and there is a recent article by Tobias Weber um, that may be helpful here. So if you're working with uh, legacy materials, um, maybe this is a way of doing that. This is kind of hands, hindsight, um, what I wish I had done differently. All right, and that is it for me. And then I'll pass it on to Kayla. Thank you. I appreciate being invited to this um, forum to talk about this process of um, RTP and tenure um, coming from the California State University System, the largest university system in the United States, um, which resides on California Indian homelands. I myself am Hupa Yurat Karuk, working and living on Wayat homelands today. I also was hired into a Native American Studies Department, um, the longest standing NES department, um, 27 years in the CSU system. So I can speak to working at a teaching institution and a body of institutions that place a very high value on teaching. Um, I'm also in the unique position of belonging to a Council of American Indian Faculty and Staff on my campus, um, whereby Cal Poly Humboldt membership has over 30 different uh, American Indian faculty and staff, whereas most campuses have maybe a handful, and um, maybe NAS or uh, American Indian Studies or Indigenous Studies programs housed under anthropology, uh, an ethnic studies department, or um, perhaps not at all, are still building. So there's two sets of RTP standards that I had the opportunity to work with. There were general campus RTP standards uh, referenced as Appendix J in the faculty handbook for our campus, as well as um, department standards that are meant to enhance, clarify, or interpret, but not to replace the broader standards. Um, so both are standards by which my activities and collegial letters are evaluated under the three categories I think we're familiar with teaching effectiveness, um, research is termed scholarly and creative activities. Um, and so I, I was able to um, put a lot of creative activities into that as what may be broadly research um, other places um, and also service. Um, and those are all evaluated as excellent, good or minimal essential, both under Appendix J and my department standards. But the department standards help clarify, I think, more along the lines, what counts as excellent, what counts as good, what's minimal, um, and but also define these three teaching, scholarly, service um, categories as well as unique to NAS. Um, I think one change to the broader campus um, standards that changed in my probationary period was more recognition of DEI work um, that my expertise as a linguist fed into as a diversity equity fellow who trained other teachers um, and also inclusive teaching pra practices and strategies. 
So there's a, a, a part that may be unique to my campus that rewards teachers for reflecting on their use of inclusive teaching, um, providing guidance to collegial observations, um, and modes of teaching that aren't just sage on the stage, <laughs> and using data from classes to reflect on our teaching methods um, and work on mitigating equity gaps, especially in the pandemic. So that was a big change um, to the broader standards. My standards for the department actually were developed after I was hired and I had the opportunity to choose either one, kind of um, work with those. I chose to work with my department standards. Um, this may be a hum uh, Cal Poly Humboldt quirk, but the various levels that your working personnel action file or your tenure file as it's being built goes through um, and relies heavily on collegial observations in the form of letters. So it's important that I had um, letters um, speaking to these categories every semester, at least three letters for each category. For me in a small department, that meant that um, my department chair and sometimes myself um, reaching out to um, more historically supported disciplines such as history, anthropology, English, child development, other departments with tenured faculty to observe me. Um, so and then I turn in a personnel data sheet or a list of my activities and how I fit, how I feel they fit RTP along with evidence. But the collegial letters are very heavy in my um, institution and various levels of review would take direct quotes from those letters in their own evaluate, evaluative letters. Um, and I get to work with my own department or initiating unit personnel committee. Um, before it goes on to those other levels to make sure how I categorize things fits. Um, so in that personal data sheet, personnel data sheet, um, that would be a great place to quote the Garrett or Harris article to reference it or other articles that may be relevant to your discipline. Um, I have a department chair that encourages referencing research on student evaluations, for example, for my discipline and sort of the the feedback that students give when they're learning about, um, for example, history, truth and history and uh, <laughs> Native American studies classes and the various reactions that come out in student evaluations and how to um, kind of talk about that and address that in your, in your list of activities and teaching effectiveness. Um, so as mentioned in the Garrett and Harris article, there is times where I found difficulty in determining still um, between service and scholarly or creative activities, um, but my department standards um, were pretty good in pushing what I thought was service back into scholarship, and I actually received pushback to do that <laughs> numerous times um, where necessary. Um, and scholarly activities uh, may be categorized as category one or category two, with category one carrying more weight which you would think of as like um, publishing peer-reviewed works or book chapters, but it also includes, um, for my institution, presenting original work at both the national, regional workshop, um, forums, uh, on panels, um, publishing digital humanities projects or websites in NAS or cognate disciplines, so linguistics would, would count for me. Um, organizing those scholarly conferences where this is presented, um, receiving external grants, editing volumes, and I was pretty active in doing that both for um, California Indian Studies within Native American Studies as well as Dene Languages um, and California Indian Linguistics. So um, we, I belong to an organization, um, California Indian Studies and Scholars Association, and um, we've had um, a lot of CSU level cross-pollinization of California Indian studies in general lately. <laughs> um, in addition, one oral history project um, was funded by the National Endowment for Humanities, met multiple category one goals for me um, regarding um, an activism regarding the, the Go Road, Gasky Orleans Road that led to the 1988 Ling versus Nikpa Supreme Court case. Um, regarding sacred high country for Talawa, Karuk, and Yurok peoples. Um, a lot of those people who were alumni of what was then Humboldt State University are master speakers today. And so 
that oral history project also included some language work, which was really great, I thought. And I got to introduce students to IRB processes and um, and these master speakers. That was that was great. They conducted and transcribed interviews as a part of that. So I, that was also encouraged as perhaps um, working your research into your into your classes. Um, I primarily work with community to interpret and use existing archive materials. Um, less field work today, but. Um, on those community-based documentation projects that I do. Uh, they also wrote evaluative letters, um, my colleagues that I uh, work with in those. Um, that includes credentialed teachers and local school districts. Um, and I have a co-authored book chapter with Justin Spence on the process. Um, so even if I haven't necessarily published like traditional texts from the communities I work with, um, documenting that process and how work feeds into a corpus work feeds directly into um, these projects, I, I think is important and is recognized. Um, and a, a part of me really needed to focus on the community building and the complex relationships mentioned as far as the uh, Garrett and Harris article. And that was reinforced to me in speaking with both elders and other indigenous scholars. Um, and so I've done a lot of work kind of building that. Um, I've also spent time rerouting resources directly to California Dene language cultural practitioners as a part of that. Um, so a lot of smaller grants that help feed into their work directly. Um, canoe making, TEK based plant knowledge are some projects that I can think of. Um, even if I don't always use that in my own classroom or publish those materials like the, as a product, the process and redirecting resources is important, I think, in my discipline, NAS. Um, let's see here. Um, I feel more, for me, more permissions are needed. We have to work regionally on tribal IRBs, um, especially in this transition from Humboldt State University to Cal Poly Humboldt. So that also is kind of a form of service to kind of work on those processes. Um, one piece of advice for all three categories that I received was to look at our university strategic plan and comment again in my personal data sheet how my activities met goals in our university strategic plan. So for me as being a Hispanic serving institution as well as specific language regarding tribal community partnerships, I quoted those portions of the strategic plan directly in my um, PDS. And um, my department uh, posted on Facebook <laughs> soliciting letters from the community. Um, sometimes I'm just available on Facebook to respond to things in my messages all the time. And people commented on that in, my, in their letters saying like, she's available and helps me work with language you know, in this, this medium. So um, people did that. I cannot directly solicit from students letters. That was um, very clear to me. Um, but I do, but I could give a list of people I've worked with to my department chair. Um, and that could be, you know, independent language study or for their own research. And um, they were contacted um, through my department chair and uh, whether they wrote a letter or not, um, that was one way I could do that, but not directly. Um, and then a big difference, I think, between R1 and CSU is I don't have regular access to student research in the form of grad students, but I do have undergrads who take specific classes with me um, where they can gain some intro to linguistics-like knowledge or um, further their knowledge of specific indigenous languages that may go on to language research, uh, research grad school, more advanced language study with me, um, environment and community program on, on campus as a master's program is where we, if we do work with grad students, that's one program where we do that. And um, NAS is a service department a lot of times to other uh, departments, especially the sciences. So um, Cal Poly Humble has this unique thing where um, science majors, over 80% of them take an NAS class within their first two years to meet multiple general ed requirements. And my classes on language, you know, um, they're more language oriented are included in that um, with the recent ethnic studies requirement, um, AB 1460 legislation that were passed. Um, and so 
with all that, it, there is a lot of service and time that goes in as a small department. Um, and all those things uh, with my PDS, I, I count hours and things. <laughs> but a lot also, I think, is pushed into scholarship as well. If you if you publish on the process itself, you know the uniqueness of your collaborations and and what have you. So I, I will go ahead and stop now and say thank you. It's Adia. Not sure who's in charge now, but this is the question period. <laughs> um, there was a question that I responded to um, in writing that Claire Bowern put in the chat. I don't know if everybody saw it, but I just comment on it also orally. Um, I had mentioned service as a category. I mean, we all mentioned service as a category and um, working with communities outside the university as a form of service and Claire brought up the point that at some universities that might not be allowed to count as service and service might only include administrative service on campus. Berkeley is a public university and maybe that's the reason why at Berkeley public service quote unquote um, is definitely definitely encouraged as a form of service so that work that you would do in schools or in underprivileged communities or really Kind of anywhere that you quote unquote apply your research outside of the university would count as service here, but that's true that that might not be true elsewhere. We have lots of time for questions. I think we should read them out for people. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that would be best. Kayla, do you want to read your question or do you want me to read your question as a sure, first? I can, I can read it. I see a question um, from Daisy Rosenblum. Uh, two questions. Was there a way that you were able to demonstrate and include the effectiveness of your mentoring for students and community members who are important for language revitalization, but are not doing that work in an academic context as students? Um, and then the second question for the first one, I think that um, the collegial letters, um, sometimes um, other CAFES members um, spoke to that as well, but also um, the solicitation of letters from community also um, spoke to that. And I think the effectiveness of that um, sometimes um, perhaps my IUPC or department um, committee or chair um, could help help shape some of that more if if um, and help kind of speak to you know what was needed what they knew about my work and how to write that kind of letter if if needed um, was there a way that you included your support community based cultural and creative practices i.e. canoe making in your dossier if so where did you locate that um, let's see here I believe so. <laughs> I, there's there's things that I have put out into the community um, where I think they would be more category two of um, scholarship and creative activities, not category one. But I did include that, and in, in whether that's online based, you you input into your um, PDS direct links. Um, for example, language videos I created, um, or or consulted with and helped others create. Um, I, I put that into creative activities, but it would not be a category one, it'd be a category two, for example. Um, and that would be scholarship and creative activities. Let's see. And I think I caught that, all that, that full question. Thank you. And Claire comments that only we can see the questions, so we do need to read them out. Yeah. <laughs> 
there's a comment from Josiah just saying thank you. And then there is a, a question directed at me from Miriam uh, Lapierre, I'm assuming. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you said you included your cover materials in your tenure packet, but how concretely do you include the files since they're not conventionally PDF or PDF of all documents? Um, that's what I was trying to explain um, that you can't just send everything over because first is really big but second there is also kind of sensitivity issues with some of the data sharing and where's where that's housed and things like that and creating like graded access and things like that so that's why i created that uh, readme file that told the reviewer if you want to look at collection x here's how would you get access to it and so in the case of pilar they would have had to create their own username names if they didn't have one. And for things that, there are some things that are user access. And what that means is that if you have a username, then you can access that material. Some things are subscriber access, um, which means that they will require a password. And um, like I said, what my strategy was just to say, give a password to our uh, executive admin, and say they could contact her. I don't think anyone did, but I don't know. Like she, I never asked her, and I guess she's not supposed to tell me. I don't know. So like I, I don't know whether the subscriber materials in Ilar were looked at, but there is a lot of user access materials that could be looked at. And for Isla, I talked to uh, Susan about the best way to grant access to somebody, and uh, it was to create an account uh, that had a temporary name and a temporary password. Um, and that same password worked for materials that were subscriber access. So I put that in the README file. Um, and the CLA materials were available. So you don't need a password for those. And if I can just make a comment, um, when you were presenting, Jorge, it, it struck me how much work you had done in your kind of in your tenure process to make those archival collections um, accessible and understandable to users. And one thing that thinking about this whole this whole thing has kind of made me realize is one of the consequences, which is both good and bad, um, but one of the consequences of um, including archival materials as significant parts of your dossier on a par with publications is that they then get evaluated. Um, and, you know, some will be good and some will be less good, potentially. And that then puts on the linguist. <clears throat> the duty to make sure that their archival collections are good. For example, by having descriptive materials like what you wrote, um, whether you do it as part of the process or you've already done it in a separate article or there's a detailed finding aid or whatever. And it also means that it means that thinking about the organization of your archival collection and thinking about how easy it will be for users to find what they're looking for and how valuable the contents are like those are things that reviewers when you come up for tenure are going to be assessing um, and so there's a little bit of a nudge which like i say can be both positive and negative a little bit of a nudge to do a good job when you're doing those things <laughs> well i think we want to do a good job to start with <laughs> yeah, yeah of course of course yeah but i think it's, um, it's easy it's easy for people who are skeptical to think of those archival collections as just data dumps Mm -hmm. And the more visible and evaluated they are, the less, um, you know, the less good it is for them to be thought thought of that way. Yeah. I, I, my own take is that I know that you guys say that in the paper, and I know that other people have suggested the same thing, that you could write a, an article that is a description of a collection. And there is a few really good ones out, like, you know, Gabi Caballero, who I think is here, has one, and Amalia has one, and Sophie Salner had an early one. But to me, that's putting another publication. So you're going back to the traditional output in, and so people will be measuring and evaluating the fact that you've published one description and not necessarily going to look at the primary collection. Um, and so I, I opted for creating the short guides um, and giving access to that as a way of like, I do want people to look at the corpora um, not thinking I'm going to publish a description of the collection, then people will be able to measure that. Um, I, agree, I think yeah. you say that you can serve as an anchor. I think it's the wording that you used in the 
Um, and I, I agree that that's true. But I think it goes back to the traditional output issue. I feel that what, what can be helpful in some cases, depending on the collection, but what can be helpful is the kind of thing that you wrote, for instance, embedded in the collection somewhere, mm -hmm. like as a, as a finding aid with pointers to individual files or you know whatever works best. You know, sometimes a large archival collection can be dauntingly confusing to a user and some <laughs> kind of descriptive guide can be quite helpful. Yeah, especially the file structure is so unique between different collections. Yeah. yeah. There's a question from Mary Pastor, which I'll read. For department or institution standards that specify a quantity of publications, for example, one paper per year, how do you count non-canonical products or are you advocating for approach, an approach that avoids this kind of quantification? That's a good question. Um, at my university, we don't do that. Um, so it's sort of not an issue. Um, I guess I would advocate for avoiding that kind of quantification, but you probably, like if that's the requirement at an institution, you maybe can't push back against that. So it seems like the argument you would want to make is this, this is as important, this thing that isn't in your list is as important as this other thing that is in your list. It requires like roughly the same amount of time or more and effort to produce than a peer review journal article. Um, if you're doing an archival collection with like the appropriate metadata and all of that. And, um, and that was, for example, that's what I tried to do with my chair leading up to the process of tenure. So in our year, yearly reviews, I would put a, a publication of a journal article and then that counted as a, an archival deposit counted as a second uh, item in the same category. Um, and I tried to explain like the amount that it, of work and effort that it takes to create this is equivalent. Um, and I think that the resolution of the LSA says something to that effect. Um, and so I, yeah, and so that was helpful. And I feel like also impact is an important thing to emphasize. Like academics traditionally are used to thinking of impact in terms of other articles or books that have been influenced by this article and book. And archival collections can have that impact on academic publications, but they can also have significant impacts on community life, um, language revitalization, et cetera. And so articulating the importance of that project, both in terms of the effort, as you say, and in terms of a range of impacts that are not just scientific knowledge. Um, I feel like that's the important um, piece of advocating for the importance of uh, collections. I'll just say my RTP standards still count. <laughs> um, they just they still count the number of products, um, but so if, I, if I'm not producing a number of category one, I make up for that by producing more in category two um, year to year. That's that's how it works for for me at least for some what would be considered non canonical products. Let me just say something about. Arc, uh, about impact, which Andrew men mentioned. I think we pointed out in the article, but I'm, I can't quite remember correctly now, that number of visits is not a good way to to um, to assess something because very often someone will use an archive over and over and over and over again, but that's one visitor. And, and there may not be many visitors in the first years, but then later, Maybe because of uh, the, the reputation of the archive growing, or maybe because of work in other languages in the same family, the, the archive might become more important. So 10 years down the line or 15 years down the line, it might uh, have more visits that is from more people than initially. So number of visits just isn't a good way to, to count. Yeah, we did. I think we did put that somewhere. And also some arch archives won't even tell you how many people have used your collection. So good. Um, there's a question um, for tenure. Is advising students from other countries taken as important or the same value as advising students in the same university or inside the US? Um, that's an interesting question. I can 
I can try to say something to that because I've actually had, I've done that. Um, I, it's hard, I think, because you have to explain in what capacity you're doing that. And so, for example, I'm supervising a thesis in Venezuela of a student who wanted to uh, do a linguistic thesis in the School of Anthropology, an undergraduate thesis. Um, but the process is that, that I think that that doesn't get any kind of official recognition here, other than as a very vague uh, category in our annual report that is like other supervision. Um, and I honestly don't know how much weight um, goes into that, but um, I'll say that particularly if you are uh, training others who are working on the same language or uh, building capacity locally as part of your project, whether that's through a documentation workshop or uh, with teachers in the community or things like that. Um, and I agree with Andrew that that in some places would be categorized as service, but you should uh, highlight that that was part of the research project and that um, that also contributed to the building of the relationship that enables that research. Um, and it's that kind of idea of presenting the whole, the whole and not just the parts as like separate items. Um, I hope that answers your question. Undoubtedly, the exact evaluation of it is going to vary from one institution to another. Everything varies a little bit from one institution to another. Yeah, I can't recall. It was, I thought it was a very interesting question because I can't really recall. I mean, lots of people in our department have advised people who are not Berkeley students in some capacity, and one does put it on one's, you know, in one's material. And I don't really have a sense of whether of how it's taken. I've always assumed it was taken as just as important as local students, but I, who knows? Um, I think there's a really interesting question, a difficult question. Um, what strategies do you recommend if the R1 department you are in, asking for a friend, um, doesn't value archival or service community work or descriptive materials in favors theory and a quantity of peer reviewed publications, and if it seems impossible to push back? Um, I have encountered this, not at my university, but I have spoken to people who have had an experience like this. Um, and I do, I do feel that um, it would be good if one could have that conversation effectively in the department level, but um, if somebody was really being frustrated at the department level, one thing they could do is in their university, go to the administrative person who is sort of, I mean, high level administrative person who's in charge of equity issues. Um, so at Berkeley, you might, I mean, every institution is different, but at Berkeley, you might make connections to the vice chancellor for um, equity and inclusion, who would be very committed to the idea that it's an important part of the work of the faculty to do diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging work. And if your department is systematically undervaluing that work, um, that's something that, like, that's something that the administration would be interested in, and that your department would not be happy to have them find out about. Um, so, like, if you emphasize that this work is not just "quote unquote" service, but it is actually DEI work um, that the institution as a whole might value, that might help change the departmental perception. That, that I mean, doing it. Actually, going to that person might be a little challenge might, that creates controversy, but maybe just talking about it in those terms in the department might be helpful. I was going to say that when you're in a position where you're pre tenure, and if you have, if you feel that the environment is hostile, then you're probably not <laughs> very likely to go above the department or outside the department because I think that that will probably also like create even more like antagonism it's it's a really hard question uh tulio and I, I don't think either of us <laughs> in any of us would have a good answer for it i i think i think one thing that i've seen recently that maybe would work as a kind of workaround maybe um is like 
try, especially for archival collections, like both Scylla and Delamen have now awards. And so I think that even if a given department didn't place value on their archival collection, the fact that an archival collection could have an award or an honorary mention or something like that would definitely get credit. I mean, I would hope that it would. <laughs> Uh, because it's something that is done externally by peers who um, show that your work is really valuable. Um, so that would be, I think, maybe a workaround. And Claire Bowen mentions in a comment, in a question, she says, another possible option, if the candidate can recommend letter writers is to pick writers that are sympathetic to this yeah. approach and that they're likely to make good arguments that can be helpful, sort of in a similar well, way to what you were saying. I would say too, ask your department chair to please read our article. That's what it's intended for. And the, and one section of it is why documentary linguistics is important. That's a good point, Alice. <laughs> there is a question. Um, the paper mentions at a few points the review of non-traditional outputs by other documentary linguists, but in possibly inevitable situations where non-documentary linguists are in a position to review documentary linguistics output, do you have any suggestions for both reviewee and reviewer in what to keep in mind? <laughs> I, th I think you say something about that in the paper of like the completeness and metadata and things like that. Then maybe um, I wonder if I'm trying to remember off the top of my head here, but I wonder if the T Burger and uh, others article may not have concrete suggestions about that because oh, that's nice. really, yeah. yeah. Um, which we cite um, in the paper. Yeah, you, yeah I, I was going to pull up the reference, but yes, it is uh, it's cited in the paper, so in the references of the paper, that should be there. Um, I mean, one thing I have found in review, I mean, I'm not exactly in the category of sort of half documentary linguist, half non-documentary linguist, I guess. But one thing I've found in reading, um, you know, tenure files for people who are coming up for tenure is that like sometimes you have to look hard in the dossier to find the things that we're talking about because sometimes they're not um, being emphasized by the candidate. So um, in the situation that the question is about, I think it would be helpful for the sympathetic non-documentary linguist just to kind of bear in mind that this research is going to include a whole bunch of different kinds of things that might not be listed in the first section of the CV under publications, but they might be listed on page nine um, and, you know, try to find out about those things to be able to emphasize them as well. I, th I think like when the, I think as a candidate, you're in a position to contextualize your work in a way that other people don't have access to that kind of information of, for example, why a project was cut short. Like, you know, like there could be a number of things that happened that you are the only person who has firsthand knowledge of that and the community. But, um, they're probably not going to be the assessors for you. And so, like, I think it's really important that if there is a required research statement, you contextualize your work in a way that highlights what you've done uh, in the context of both the field and uh, but also of the community that you work with and the general social cultural norms of where you work. Um, if it is optional, like here, then I would suggest that you still write one, even though you may feel like additional work on your part to have to do that. Um, but it's the way that, at least in my view, you can um, kind of shift people's perceptions to be more aligned with how you see your own work. Um, and I, I think that, that that is valuable. I, I, there was a conversation recently on Twitter with Jesse Greaser and somebody else about um, just taking control of the conversation by writing a research statement that presents 
uh, your research as you see it. Yeah, I think that's a, exactly right. You mentioned letters from from the people in the community that you work with, and I think that for one of my reviews, I did actually get that. I have no idea. As you say, you don't know what happens on the evaluator side, but I felt like that was a good thing to do. Um, and I mean, I, some institutions may not permit it because um, they're not in academic positions, but I think if they do permit it, it would often be a really helpful contribution to a file. A barrier may be that if the community speaks a different language that is not English and nobody can write a letter yeah. in English. I'm thinking of everybody who works in Latin America where it would be very unlikely that a community could write a support letter as much as they would like to uh, because then they would be in a different language and I don't know how that would uh, yeah. be taken by both the uh, university I would, staff. I would hope, uh, at my university, I would hope that a letter in Spanish could be read. Yeah. <laughs> Here, translation is, can be made. Yeah. Oh, there's a comment from a question from Wesley. Following the comment question about non-supportive departments, I'm curious about how common it is for scholars to not be hired, promoted, tenured, etc., because their work is in non-traditional documentary and linguistics realms. He noted that Jorge's and Kayla's dossiers sounded quite strong beyond the parts focused on this webinar. What about people who do great documentation but don't have many regular articles? I, my own inclination here is that this is why it's really important to try to um, change, like, the general culture around how those products are reviewed. And that's why, for example, I kind of, personally, I just took the stand of, I'm not gonna write a collection description that is just another article. Um, I want the collection themselves to be uh, measured. And I don't know if that will impact how other people coming after me can uh, be reviewed or, um, or like here, especially like be assessed uh, year to year, but um, but I would hope that you know like the more that we try to together think of ways in which this non-traditional outputs can be measured, uh, then we're changing the culture a bit, and um, and then just tip to the point where like that has the same or more value than a general article. Um, I think it would take time. Um, I think the article does a good job of putting us in that direction. But... I'll just say, you know, at a teaching university, um, you absolutely have to have excellence in the teaching category um, and then excellence in one other category. Um, I set my sights on, on teaching and service um but along the way found myself um excellence in the three at least at, um in the csu um you receive a lot of feedback on how to uh you, you submit your file multiple times along the way and then have to do professional development um plans if you want to strengthen up to all three um but there's room to be minimal essential in one category, for example, but it ha you have to have excellence in the teaching category. I'm, I'm not sure if I am, uh, said that in what I said earlier, but I'll reemphasize that too. It's an interesting question, Wesley, Wesley your question about how common is it for people not to be hired um, or tenured? Those are two quite different questions, obviously. Like it's easy to imagine I mean, I think it, it, it has to be true that there are numerous cases where people are very accomplished documentarians who don't get a job that they apply for um, because it, you know, they don't satisfy the presuppositions or whatever of the hiring committee um, for the reasons that you say. Um, I am interested 
to think about how often that might be true at the tenure level. That is how often people who are accomplished documentarians who don't publish peer reviewed articles don't get tenure. Um, it must happen, but uh, it's an interesting question. <laughs> Wesley says, you all can't see me, but I'm sitting here nodding and appreciating your responses. <laughs> Thank you, Wes. <laughs> Zachary O'Higgins. Would it be beneficial for language archives or Delamen to issue professional recommendations on how best to evaluate archival collections, perhaps related to the criteria used for determining the SSILA and Delamen archiving awards? Um, yes, <laughs> I think the answer to that is yes. <laughs> um, yeah, I think it would be useful like, for somebody to do it. Mm. I don't know if archives should do it um, because we have a bit of a competitive interest. Um, like each archive is structured in a different way and the archives recommendations might be do it the way we do it mm. um, rather than the way they do it. It would be good for Delaman or some yeah. broader organization to do something like that. Uh, Daisy put a question that is directed at me. Um, you didn't mention it here, but you, I shared with me earlier that your syllabi are also licensed under a uh, Creative Commons uh, agreement that you track use and the impact of that work. Do you feel that that was an important piece of your dossier? Um, here, in the way that teaching effectiveness is measured, um, they want to know about extramural impact of your teaching. It's kind of hard to imagine how that would take place other than uh, by being invited to perhaps present at other people's classes or training people outside of the university walls. Um, I think one way in which you could do that is also kind of have an idea of um, if you have produced syllabi or created new courses and other people are interested in adopting some of those materials, then just getting some general sense of uh, where those materials um, have ended up. Um, I, if anyone asks for a while, my syllabi, my general policy is here it is. Uh, here's additional context for how I run it. Uh, feel free to use it. Uh, if you do use it, I would love to hear back. Um, and um, because we actually have to report it. Um, I, the, what's interesting is that, in fact, Teaching is not measured here by the external reviewers. Um, so the external reviewers are only measuring your research. Um, and so, for example, I would have liked for them to have access to a teaching dossier that included that kind of information. Um, but that is not part of our tenure dossier, either for the external reviewers or for even the committee um, at, inside the university. Um, so it's a little bit invisible. The teaching in the tenure process here is kind of invisible. Um, the research, the department chair comments on it in his letter. Um, and there is, a, I think they have to like compile some sort of summary sheet of evaluations um, that is um, mentioned only in that context. And it's only your department chair um, that gets to see it. Um, like, and so, it is invisible, but for example, for um, for internal teaching awards, um, they definitely ask that kind of information. Um, and, and my department put me up for one and that went in the file. Hmm. I hope that answered your question, Daisy. Daisy writes, thank you. You're muted, You're Mark. Muted, Mark. Yes, I just realized 
uh, we don't need to prolong the awkward silence any longer than necessary. If, um, <laughs> if there are no other questions, then we can wrap up here. Um, so let me uh, just say by way of closing, a uh, word of great thanks and appreciation to Kayla Begay, Jorge Rosses Labrada, Andrew Garrett, and Alice Harris for such an excellent presentation. And to you all for joining us today and for your excellent questions. I think this is probably the most questions we've had, the longest Q&A session we've had in a while. Um, so it shows that there's a lot of engagement, a lot of interest in this topic. Um, you all should receive a follow-up email in the next day or two with information about the video recording of this webinar and joining the LSA if you're not already a member. Um, so I will end this webinar in a few moments, and when I do, it will very abruptly throw us all out. So just to give you all a heads up as it's about to happen. So thanks again, and we look forward to seeing you all next time. Take care. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. Thank you.